Good evening, all. And I want to thank you all for coming to a Ward 3 meeting this Wednesday evening, May the 29th. Again, I welcome you all, and I'm sure there'll be some other people coming in as, as the time goes on. It's, it's always a busy time of year when we get into the end of May, beginning of June, with everything that's happening. Um, and just to uh, bring you up to speed on uh, things that are happening, um, next week we'll be busy. The City Council will be busy as we start to take a look at the uh, uh, fiscal 2020 budget, um, which will be before us next week. Public hearings will begin next Monday, um, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, which is June uh, 3, 4, and 5. And then Thursday night, the 6th we hold is just if we need to have to um, have an extra night. But that usually doesn't, doesn't happen. But in any case, we'll be busy ourselves next week um, working on that. And the budget um, um, is, is in, you know, I would say pretty decent shape. I've just started to look it over. I know other councils are doing the same. We just received our budget books just the other day. Uh, I guess they thought we were going to read them on a nice Memorial Day weekend, but that didn't happen, I have to admit. But um, I'm in the process of looking things over just to see where we're at and, and uh, what additions the, uh, the mayor has made uh, to it, hopefully, um, in areas that we want it, um, which would be public safety is one of our major, major um, importance that, uh, you know, we want to see work done. Uh, surely want to see more fire people, men and women in the firehouses, but we definitely want to see some more police officers uh, in uh, working the police station as well, and not so much at the station, but as working outside, because um, that that's a very, um, very uh, difficult situation right now. We need more cops on our streets. So in any case, that's, that's a, a beginning of some of the things we're going to be doing next week. I, just before we go on a little bit further, uh, with a little bit of housekeeping matters, I do want to indicate um, one of my colleagues is here, City Council at Large, Winthrop Farron. I appreciate him uh, coming this evening. And I also have uh, uh, City Council at Large, uh, Darren Court is also here, and I appreciate him coming this evening. Our school committee member, Mark DiGostino, is, is here, and I'm going to let him speak at, uh, somewhere um, during the course of the evening as well, so we could just bring up to speed in a few uh, things in regards to um, school committee. Officer Healy is going to speak tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about Crime Watch, crime matters within the, the neighborhood, um, even neighborhood watches, try to get other people to come together to create more crime watches uh, because I think it's, uh, I think it's needed and I, I apologize. Uh, City Council from Ward 5, uh, Ann Borgard is also uh, tiptoeing through. She thought she'd do it quietly, but we noticed her. Uh, and I appreciate her for coming this evening. Again, that's what Officer Healy's gonna talk about this evening when we get to him. Um, because I, I think we, we're losing track of how we need to be doing things and how things need to be reported to the police department so that we can solve some issues within the neighborhoods. And uh, I've had some issues over, over the last few weeks that uh, I had to work with, uh, with the officer on and I also had to work with uh, Captain Baccaro on. Um, we got them solved naturally, but we just wanna you know, make sure everybody's doing the right thing and the importance of what we need to do. So um, that's something that he's going to be um, talking about. Mr. May, um, who is our uh, economic development uh, director, was going to come this evening, but unfortunately he was able to. He was going to um, bring us up to speed on some of the things that are happening um, in the city and, and things with, uh, in new, you know, with new construction. And uh, I'm, I'll do that before we close. I'll just give you a few highlights of uh, a few things that are going on. I know when we met last, it was in June of last year, and then summer came. I usually don't do them in the summer months. It was hot and humid, and uh, then the fall came, and, and I have to uh, apologize for not having any other meetings since then, but I did undergo some hip surgery back in the fall through the holiday season, still in, in the mend a little bit, but um, moving forward, and um, my, my mind wants to go fast, but there's something about it that the body just doesn't want to run as fast. So, I don't know, Council Fowl, you're going to have to give me some expertise on how we keep that going. But uh, in any in any case, uh, um, it's just it. it I, I'm I'm out there. I am out there, and um, I do uh, indicate to, to you that uh, I know this evening you were asked to put my name on a nomination paper sheet, and I appreciate that. And uh, I am a candidate again for uh, City Council Ward 3 for a ninth term, so I hope uh, I can have your support as, as well. So um, with that being said, I apologize for not having meetings sooner, but we'll be back, um, we'll be back on track again uh, um, in the fall. I do want to just, um, I do want to mention a couple of things we talked about 
um, before we did depart uh, last June, and I think one of which was, you know, the completion of Belmont Street. And uh, Belmont Street finally was completed to where the destination was to be, which is, is moving closer to naturally the entrance exit to the high school. Um, traffic control lights at Linwood and Lorraine, everyone's has indicated it's been a nice blessing, an easier take of coming out of Linwood, coming out of Lorraine, um, no more stop sign type of thing and have to go with the flow of traffic for your own safety. The streets much wider. Um, it seems to be working very, very well. That will continue on, I believe next spring, they will continue to go down further. They'll go down actually right to West Street, even to where the uh, uh, Burger King is and in that area there and, and have that completion as well. A lot of people ask me about Forest Avenue. I think Forest Avenue is wrapped into another state program, but it's also City Road as well. And, and uh, I don't think there's anyone that won't disagree with me that we need to do something with Forest Avenue because it's just totally, totally out of out of uh, out of shape out of disarray it really really is and uh, um, it, you know the curb and the, and the roadway match each other and it's not just right so hopefully we'll be seeing something happen there in the next um, I wouldn't say next year but within at least the next uh, couple of years um, streets this year in the ward are going to be a little limited because the funds the way they come in I know I'm having one street that, that will be taken care of off of uh, Hillberg Avenue um, and that's Cottage Grove area there. That street has to be done. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that a couple others will be given to me at the end of the season before the season closes and we start making, um, you know, the asphalt. And um, I don't know where, where and when, if that will happen. Um, just keep in mind, us councilors don't make the decision on, on what streets. We just give a list of streets to the mayor and DPW commissioner and they, you know, sit I'll call the council and, and talk with what they can do to get at least a couple of streets each ward. Um, but it's not easy. You deal with almost 296 miles of street, and it's it's difficult. Um, seven ward councils. Everybody wants to have a street done, a two or three, and it's it's tough. It really uh, really is. And some, believe it or not, are still um, uh, private ways and, and are not public ways. Um, I think the first time ever we're going to make uh, Alexander's Way, Rachel Way, where it's the uh, over 55 off of West Chestnut Street, um, but it's a 14-year-old project, and then um, they spoke to me, the, the, the uh, residents there, to see what we could do to get the street uh, done, which only made sense because it was completely overhauled, engineered-wise again, because we had to pay the, um, you know, the contractor, um, you know, his due, and, and it was really. Uh, pretty much a done situation that if we didn't do it now, um, we'd probably end up having to spend money a few years from now because of the decay of what could happen to the street. So that street's gonna be made uh, made um, public and that'll be happening, ladies, as you know, that'll be happening um, probably by June, July, the latest. It's already left the planning board, so it should be coming back to city council at our next finance meeting. Um, and then I have a couple others off of um, Ash Street, and West Meadow, and uh, Julia, excuse me, which, a old street similar to what we had across the way with Emory Street and uh, in uh, Cohesit and, and, uh, and a couple of the other streets over there. Um, Talbot, they were old streets, never paved the correct way, and I hope to have you know, those streets off of Ash Street accepted, and I don't know if I'll get to them this year or not, but um, those are the things we continue to try to work on, but um, as Council Fowler and Council Derrickwood would even tell you, it's, it's not easy to get all the streets done that we, that we want to get done. So. I just wanted to bring you up to, to speed on that. And um, the other thing I'm working on, um, and, and there is some money coming from the state, uh, State Representative Cassidy and State Representative Cronin uh, have placed in the budget that we uh, receive some monies for um, finally doing some work to the Timothy, um, uh, Timothy Holster Park right here in West uh, Chestnut Street. Um, it's something I've been asking for for the last several years. Uh, that park is utilized, but it's utilized in a nice way, orientated with family. If I uh, notice dads and sons in there playing basketball, um, it's not utilized in any other such way of, you know, I think of, of destruction or anything. I think it's just utilized in a nice sense of way with people at lunchtime stop and even go in and start to, you know, play a game of quick ball and uh, basketball, and I think that's good. And we're going to do some work there and, and smooth out the ground, and, and uh, um, I know the money will be coming if we have to put some money in from 
the city, uh, I've already spoken to the mayor about that, to uh, see what we can do because um, Mr. Holster was a, a Vietnam vet and uh, he was also nephew to uh, the late uh, Mayor Paul Stadinsky as well. So we wanna, we wanna you know, dress that one up and um, it's, a, it's not a park that you have to worry about who's in there at night because West Chestnut Street's you know, a, a really quiet street after, after the sun does go down a little bit. You don't see the travel like you do during the course of the day. And, um, but anyhow, those are a couple of things that uh, I've got going. And um, I think at this point in uh, time, I'm just gonna, before I bring up Officer Healy, I'm gonna um, ask the school committee member, um, Maki DiGostino, if he wants to come up and say a couple of words, and then we'll have uh, Officer Healy speak uh, in regards to Crime Watch. Mr. Committee Man, I'm sure everybody knows the school committee member from Moad 3, Mark DiGostino. Your turn. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, keep my part of the comments brief. Um, just a few things. The most exciting, and uh, in the three and a half years I've been on the school committee, this is the first time I can say this, that we were able to balance our budget without laying anybody off. Um, so we're, yeah. Um, so it's, a good thing and we're happy about that but at the same time you know there's a part of I think all of us that's like geez the past three we had to let so many people go in order to balance those so yes it's great um, that that this time we were able to do that without without any layoffs um, there were some folks who retired and those positions were left open and that was part of how we were able to do that um, so as more money comes in and typically over the summer as the state settles their budget then we'll see you know more money coming in um, we'll be able to look at filling those positions that are that are still open due to retirements um, <clears throat> so let's see um, okay just so you kind of know what our priorities are as monies do come in um, it's going to be all about classroom staff teachers paraprofessionals um, and then if we uh, also we're looking to make sure that we are investing in technology because we have the new online testing so we need to have enough devices with that we've got to try to add at least a little bit of support staff for our technology department um, so those will kind of be the areas where as money comes in you'll see us um, putting it um, also, I think everybody's probably aware, but if you're not, um, our superintendent of schools, Kathleen Smith, her retirement will be as of June 30th. Um, so she'll be leaving us after, I believe, 42 years in the district. Um, we've appointed as interim superintendent, um, Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas. Um, so for until we are able to get a um, superintendent search going, which will that'll start sometime in the fall. Um, so in the meantime, Deputy Superintendent Thomas will serve as our interim. Um, so he'll take over on July 1st. Um, so, and I think he's gonna do a great job as an interim. Um, <clears throat> the Huntington School, uh, I'm not sure for those of you who aren't aware that roof has, has been an issue for a very long time. Um, we are nearing the end of the application process to get um, state funds to help us put the roof on that building and get that redone. There will be some money from the city side, and I want to thank uh, Councillor Ineri for um, supporting that. Um, anytime the schools want to make a capital expenditure or investment like that, that requires council approval. Also, Councillor Farwell and Beauregard were at the meeting where that was where that was discussed. Um, and Durinning Court, I think I got all. And, and Councillor Lally, sorry. Um, so I want to thank all of the, and Councillor Nicastro. Sorry. <laughs> Any other city councillors I've missed? <laughs> um, so I, I, let me just say it this way. I want to thank the city council for their support uh, because we need their support in order to get this kind of a project done. And that roof, for those of you who are unaware, is at a point where there are so many leaks, trash barrels aren't enough. We have square kiddie pools up there and pumps with hoses out the window um, to keep that going and, and to not have leaks where the kids are. So uh, that's something that I've kind of been pushing for for as long as I've uh, been in this position. I'm glad to finally see that we're almost there. We are waiting for the last part of 
state approval, the Mass State Building or School Building Authority had to come down, inspect, do a walkthrough with us. We've done that. Um, so hopefully, by the end of this month, we'll be able to tell you that it's a done deal and we're moving forward. And hopefully, it'll happen before the snow flies um, next year. So um, again, hopefully, I'm not jumping the gun and announcing that, but I think, I think we're in a pretty good spot there. Um, we had also applied for a grant. We did not get it for the Kennedy School area here for safety improvements, sidewalk improvements out front and on the walking path. Um, so we are going to relook at that, see what we can do to make us a stronger applicant, and we will reapply for that next spring when those applications come out again. Um, we were actually, the deputy superintendent and I were very surprised that we didn't get approved for that. We really, we really thought we had a pretty strong application, but um, we're going to go back at it next spring and, and try and get that done again. Um, and then, um, not sure if you're, for those of you who aren't aware, we are in the process of taking North Middle School offline and applying for school building authority money to renovate um, North Middle School. Um, and that's, that's going to be a, a big multi-year project. Um, and so there'll be eighth grade at North um, this coming year, and then it'll be taken offline until it's renovated and can be reopened, and we'll have a nice, beautifully renovated um, middle school, and hopefully it'll be the first of, of a few projects like that because several of our schools are, are in dire need of, of some work. Um, and finally, um, I do want to make sure I thank um, our state reps, um, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassidy, Michelle Dubois, and our state senator, Mike Brady, for all of their support and the budget process. They're always advocating strongly for us to help us. Um, you know, we're so reliant on the state for our school funding that it's really important that we have them as an advocate or as advocates for us. Um, and they, they really do everything they can to fight for us and, and get us as much um, additional funds as, as, as we can. A lot of these grants that we apply for that are state level grants, they'll send in letters of support. The mayor does that as well. Um, and, and all of that helps. Um, helps us as well. So um, that is pretty much all I have. If anybody has any questions, what's the status of the lawsuit? Status of the lawsuit. So we are waiting for the final numbers on this year's budget. Pending that result, we'll determine whether that moves forward. Um, if that result is less than what it should be then you can expect to see that move forward. I would say, I mean, the last timeline I heard, we were talking about uh, late July, early August, if that's going to move forward, that that would be the timeline of when you'd see it. Has, has the legislation in terms of the funding formula changed? Is that not favorably, or where does that stand? So that's some of what they're discussing now. Um, and so that's why we're kind of waiting to see what they're going to do with that, and are they going to make some changes that are positive for us? Um, so that, that's all kind of what we're waiting on. When we get to the end of that budget cycle, hopefully, or the state budget cycle, hopefully they will have made some of the adjustments that we know need to be made. And, and, and again, it depends on what they do and who does it benefit. Do they target urbans? Because there's a lot of push out there to um, do a funding increase for everybody. Well, not every town needs it, you know. So we are, we're looking to see what they're going to do and what comes in this budget, um, and, and that will really tell us what, what happens. And we need that because we've got to make sure that we actually have a leg to stand on when we go. We don't want to waste our money on a lawsuit if we don't think that we've got a good chance of winning it. Yeah. Oh, great. All right. And if any of you have any other questions you think of afterwards, um, feel free to reach out to me by phone, email. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty readily available and happy to answer any follow-up questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I know, Mark, just to introduce, I know uh, one for City Council, Sue Nicastro, is in the back, and I appreciate her for uh, attending. And uh, City Council from Ward 6, uh, Mr. Lally is also here, and I appreciate um, him for attending. And just to uh, just do a quick follow-up, because he did mention the, uh, the Huntington School, and when I was contacted, I was unable to attend that day that they... The state was here, but um, and that councils will be coming before us probably within the next 30 days. And once we have approved that, then once that building has a new roof, then that school does not close. I don't think it closes for a good several years. Am I correct, Mark? I mean, it goes for 
building has to stay open as a school. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it's five, five years after you take that money. If you close it, right. you take it offline for one year. Right. And then you get a second money. Right, exactly. So um, the reason why I jump on the fact that I want that rule fixed is because I, I never want to see that school close there because it's the gem. It's the gem to Camp Hello, to be truthful with you, and it's an older structure, and it can still be utilized, and someday it may be utilized again, and you know the way, such way that it was for a good many years. We don't know that. It all depends how how population and en enrollment um, changes. So, um, with that being said, I'm going to um, at this time I'm going to ask uh, Officer Healy to um, to come up and uh, take a few minutes to talk about uh, some crime issues and some safety and any stats that he may have and. As always, I appreciate he's no stranger to us here in Ward 3. He's always been uh, right by my side at any time, and I appreciate the, the fact, I think, as all counselors do, that we have Officer Healy as our Crime Watch Coordinator. He does an outstanding job, stays on top of it, um, and, and I know even with Captain DePicaro, um, you know, they, they work together as a team as well, um, but uh, I, I think he's, you know, with everything we got going on in the city, um, I think... Well, I think we need a lot more people like Officer Healy and Captain Picaro that are out there, and, and that's something that we need to be looking at as a council. But right now, the, the, the issue is for you to make a presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Councilor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Like he says, my name's Bill Healy. I know most of you. I think I've been doing this now nine, going on ten years. He usually has two or three ward meetings, at least two a year. So I think I've made 90% of them and I enjoy coming, usually there's always a good turnout. A um, couple of things on the agenda. What, I talk, what I'm gonna talk about now, I just talked about at Council Castro's ward meeting, I think a week ago tonight, ward four, same thing, because I think it's informative. You'll like some of what I have to say, other things, I just, I, we just can't solve all the problems, but bear with me, and I'll answer any questions after. Most importantly, and we've lost a little we're going backwards just to tell this contact information. If you need to get a hold of, if you need to start a crime watch online, you could go with the Brockton Police Department website. You can, log, you can log on to that and you'll see business crime watch. All you do is click on to that and all of my contact information is there. Email address, telephone number, drop a dime text line. If you have an anonymous tip to make, you can use that. Um, Click fix, you've all heard about click fix. A lot of things I don't want to repeat because you've heard me say it and other counselors say it for years. You go on to all of those links to get a hold of me. But most importantly with contact information now, when it comes to the counselors, as an example, here we are in Ward 3. If there's an issue going on in Ward 3, it's best that you reach out to your counselor and the at-large counselor. And if you do reach out to like the at-large counselor, you gotta give the courtesy to the counselor in that ward. Because what happens is three or four different things are happening. The person who has the issue in the neighborhood, say it's crime related like a noise disturbance, I'm not even, or I should say, the police department isn't even getting those complaints. So months to years go by with a, with a neighbor, with a, with a uh, constituent, let's, let's use Ward 3 as the example, a year could go by where people are furious at the loud parties and whatnot going on in a particular neighborhood. We generate, whenever we're called to a scene for any type of call, it generates a stat. I look into, I look into the computer to get in the complaints so the counselor finally gets the complaint. For whatever reason, they call the counselor. They don't call the police to address the issue. They seethe, they call the counselor. Counselor gets a hold of me. I look up the stats. This may have been going on for a year, but the police have had zero involvement with this particular address. So yeah, we've been calling the police all the time. You look up the, you look up the statistics, no calls to the police. So now we're already behind it. Now we get the counselor calling, geez, what's going on there? We have to look into it. And a case in point was at another ward, um, We'll say it happened, we're, we're, we're on, we have a TV viewing audience, so I have to be careful with addresses and whatnot and who I talk about and whatnot. But there was an issue about a week ago, counselor sends me the information, loud house parties going on, music, weekends, afternoons, uh, late into the evening, it's been excessive for a long period of time, and the counselor is listening to the constituent, they're passionate about it, they want to resolve it, I go to look up the address. 
There's three calls that go back. There's three calls at this particular address that has nothing to do with loud music that goes back three years. Now, people will say, well, what can we do about noise complaints? Um, say that they are calling the police. Time and time again, you get a noisy neighbor. It goes on and on and on and on. You've never done nothing, but now you're finally calling the police. I mean, I shouldn't say you've done nothing. You've, you've reached out to everybody but the police. We have an issue going on in Councilor Lally's uh, neck of the woods. And um, after reaching out to the councilor, you know what I'm talking about. After reaching out to the councilor, uh, we have now, through Captain Picaro, who runs the patrol division, we've encouraged the people to call when they hear this loud music going on, night after night after night. And they have called. They've clicked fixed and they've called the police department. And we have records of all of this. So after X amount of calls, when people finally got fed up and started to call the police, we sent the police time and time and time again. I think there were eight calls when the captain instructed one of the patrolmen to take out a complaint. Can't arrest them. Took out a complaint against the noisemaker. They'll now be going to court in the very near future at a show cause hearing. And they'll address the issue. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll get a couple of neighbors to show up, which would help. But at the very least, we have the police officer who showed up, heard the noise. It went on night after night, week after week. We have a record of it. So we're able to fight back to take care of noise complaint. Bark and dog would be the same thing. It goes on forever. Nobody says anything until finally we have to act. So we can resolve issues such as the noise complaints with summer common, band, uh, loud house parties, whatnot. If you don't call, we can't do anything. And you need to reach out to the police department. You could call your counselor as a follow-up. People are afraid to call the police. I get it. They're afraid of, you know, retribution. People are going to come. They're going to find out who it is. You could use your cell phone if you're so concerned, and they'll never know who it is. You call 911 on your, on your landline, they'll know who you are or what address you're coming from. But all you have to say is you want to remain anonymous. The police aren't going to be going over to the noisemaker's house and say, hey, the person over there called. But if you don't believe that, that's okay. Use your cell phone. Call the non-emergency line. It, it doesn't come back to the, to the, uh, to the home because you're on the cell phone. And, and lodge the complaint that there's noise going on. And we'll come down and we'll, and we'll, we'll take care of it. So all I'm asking is there was a big issue on the street here. Can't mention it again because Dennis chose to have the cable here. Big issue going on and on and on. A couple of councilors mm -hmm. are involved in it. Uh, police would then get involved in it. And we believe in that person's here right now, I've been told, in which there was a big issue going on with this particular house. And update as of like 15 minutes ago, there hasn't been any additional activity. Unless I'm wrong, I'll be told maybe later. But that was a big to-do for, for the people of this particular neighborhood, yet there was no history of noise complaints until these particular people got fed up with it. And then we were notified, councils were notified, and we hope that it's ceased. And I'll talk to that person later. Um, any questions on contact information and why you don't think you should call the police for this? Or? So, yes, sir? Um, I heard the call was calling the police a number of times recently. Yep. And they asked your address. And I, I answered all the questions. But you just said um, that they asked me my name, which I gave them. But yep. um, is that a regular? Uh, I didn't get the last. Is that what? Exactly. So um, two ways to answer that. You could have, call, you could have called and, and gave your name, your address. You could ask that there's no need for me to see them. It's going on in, in this house with a particular address. The time that the police would come to your house where they would find it important is if you're not sure of the home. You know, the police, when they arrive, they're not really sure what it is that they're looking for. Like, where's the noise? Maybe I should, maybe I should speak to the complainant because there's nothing going on here. Rather than driving off and clearing the call, at times they'd want to reach out to the complainant to find out exactly what it is because the call, might have, the call on the system might be different than what the complainant was saying. 
It's just entered in as a log item. And, uh, well, as my, a, uh, my question to you is in response to your statement that you could rename remain as a non-anonymous. Yes. When you were talking to the telephone operator, you could have said, I don't want to give my name. Okay, because I called several times during this sort of yep. period of time, and only once did they ask me my name. They always asked my address, which I gave them. Yep. But I also gave my name. My question is, were they supposed to ask me my name? They always do. Okay, because they didn't always. Only I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't explain why they yeah. wouldn't. Okay, all right. Name and address, please, sir, ma'am. That's all what right. they're supposed to do. I, I can't explain why they wouldn't do it. Do what? Is that true? They're supposed to. They're supposed to. Captain okay. said so. I, I don't. I don't have. Yes, ma'am. Well, no. Nope. So if if you want to remain anonymous, it's ninety nine percent un unlikely that they would be knocking on the house, right? I would say never, because I would never do it. I was out there on the road for. 23 plus years answering a million calls. Never would I say, hey, your neighbor across the street's doing all the complaining. Just never would do it. I think it would be irresponsible. I have to go with, the, nobody would do it. Um, and I, I have to leave it at that, but, but who knows? So the bottom line is you call. If you're really concerned about your name being put out there, call on your cell phone. I don't want to give my name. There's a lot of nonsense going on, at, going on at number 20 Main Street. Police show up, loud noise, they'll address it. But to never call, and a whole year goes by, and you tell the counselors and you tell everybody else but the police that for one year I've been suffering, well now the clock starts the day you call us. Everybody understand that? And I know I'm sounding passionate about it. It's been getting really crazy the past month or whatever, and, it's been, and I've been hearing this stuff for nine years in Crime Watch. So for us to help you, you can help yourself. And I've been saying this at every ward meeting, and I'm gonna be saying for the rest of the summer when I go to these Crime Watch meetings, et cetera. Yes, sir. Uh, just for clarity, what, uh, what the policy of the police department is with respect to disclosing the name of the complainant? So I understand you're saying that yeah. in your practice, You remain anonymous. Right, yeah. can't, they, can't, they can't force you to give your name on the phone. Now, that being said, we're just talking about disturbance and stuff, the barking dog, the loud house party. But if you're gonna wanna, if, if, if there's a, uh, a crime of violence, or an assault or a robbery or any type of incident of that nature, in order for us to bring forward the bad guy, we're gonna need the information from the victim and hopefully witnesses. So if the victim wanted to remain anonymous, not to get confused with a, with a barking dog, if the victim wanted to remain anonymous, and I was just assaulted, but I'm not gonna tell you who it is, which we run into every day. People don't want to get involved, you know, the gun stuff and going on. We, we, move, on without the, we move on without the complainant and hope to build a case by way of witnesses, surveillance cameras, et cetera. So you understand not to get confused? You're a victim and you don't want to give your name, we can't force it upon you, but we'd need it to help in the prosecution of the crime that took place. Get it? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, you have another question? Oh, yep. Is the C-Click Fix site a function of the police department, or is that a separate entity? C City Hall gets all the click fix, and then, and then it, then, then hold on, it gets distributed to where it belongs. Potholes. BPW, uh, crime issues, disturbances, police department. The captain handles one million, one million of them per year. And hold on, and delegates that assignment. Well, you yes, asked, I gotta get it. And, and he delegates that assignment, if it's a narcotic thing, the captain will, will, will delegate that to the narcotics division. So it goes from city hall to wherever it belongs in the city, potholes, BPW, 
dog barking, animal control. Yeah, because it's, it's very slow and cumbersome. And I wonder what the city, what does the city pay for that? No idea. No idea. None. No. None. Because it, I, I use it from time to time. Yep. Yep. 
I will show up there on that Sunday. By the way, my hours are Monday through Friday, 4 to midnight, weekends and holidays off, but like in this particular case with the Court Street Watch, I'll be there Sunday night between 5 and 7. I've altered my schedule, so I've done that if, if that's the only time you can do it. So you can move around dates and times if you want. Um, and we, we take it there. Some people, have a, some people have a watch meeting quarterly, some people annually. When it first gets started, sometimes it's monthly until they realize it's not really necessary. But then at least everybody that shows up at the watch has my information where they can call or preferably email me their issues where I can send it back to them. And it's, just, it's just really, it's as simple as that. Does that answer that still? Um, just to let you know, uh, this was from the beginning of April. There's a fraudulent police fundraiser type group they call on the phone. And uh, Rebby Common, um, I, like the Brockton Police Department, we do not solicit for money. I, I also preside over the union. I have for like 14 years over the Patrolman's Union. We don't solicit for money. We're self-funded. We pay dues. People have called up. It's a, uh, I I'm going to read this here. Read us. Uh, call on themselves a National Police Support Fund. Uh, have you heard it? Na from what I'm gathering, it doesn't exist. So the uh, Better Business Bureau and the IRS are looking into the organization as to how they spend, how they, the solicitation practices. If you receive any calls of this nature from anybody that identifies themselves to help out the police, police don't need help. Hang up the phone. It's as simple as that. Anybody calls you on the phone looking for money, just hang it up. It's as simple as that. I can't go, go into any other type of thing that I would do other than you just don't, you just don't pay attention. Type, any type of mail comes, throw in the rubbish. We don't solicit. I think some towns may, for, for re relief, police relief funds, they call it, in the event that they killed in the line of duty, they'd have money on hand to go to a spouse. Again, uh, if it's a phone call, I, I would never give. N just never. Uh, it's as simple as that. This is being looked into. I was given this to, to mention at ward meetings. I don't run the website. No idea. I, I, um, uh, yep. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring that up to, uh, in-house IT. I'm going to bring that up to him to put to, yep. Yep. But it, but in the meantime, that's, that's true because there's always somebody, there's always a pigeon out there. And they just, they, they'll get, they get not, I'm just, not even the police type stuff, just people who they get scam phone calls and they give thousands. So the general thing, bottom line is you hang up the phone, but I will mention that some sort of warning is put onto the police department website. I thought you were going to refer to like the city website. No, 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 just yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm going to mention it. Just going to hope it gets done. Because I just delegate. Yeah, very good. No idea. We've never done it. We've never solicited. No, never. Okay, yeah. Most of those organizations have got their uh, business is actually in any of these organizations they're calling for. I mean, they get up to like a ten percent. Oh, they do. Yep. Yep. Oh, and by the way. There are legitimate organizations that, like you just said, they'll get a percentage of the money they get. Legitimate ones asking for money. I'm just saying I would never give a nickel on the phone. My cell phone five to ten times a day, it seems, I get calls from Texas and whatever. I don't answer them, and then I block the call. And then it, it does a Hopkinton. 
Hawkington comes in every day on my phone. A recording voice, I don't know why it's Hawkington, and it's a different number all the time. I just never answer. So. Yeah, like the Red Cross, yeah, preferably. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. We had for we we had for years. Absolutely, especially to the elders. Yes. They have the uh, uh, SAL students cry at, at the Broadway uh, Theater. Yep. Uh, uh, I've been there back in the day right. millions of times, and if I don't know if you guys, girls, go there, but I'll have a family. Oh, yeah, yeah. To, Officer Donahue used to go there all the time, and he had the whole program for the, uh, anybody got lost? Um, I just don't know who's gone there recently. Um, I just want to, I just want to uh, brief you, a big complaint comes in all the time, wherever I go, everyone talks about it. speeding, parking tickets, that type of stuff, we're past the winter, but snow removal issues, so on and so forth, was talked about a couple of months ago. Um, I, I have the 2018 statistics here regarding parking tickets. In, in, in Massachusetts, there's, there's, no, there's no quotas are against the law. The police can't, the police aren't told by the chief, at least they shouldn't be, to go out and write X amount of tickets. It's against the law in Massachusetts, so we don't do it. So when I give you these numbers, the numbers are what they are. Nobody forces, because they can't, the police to pull over cars, X per, cars per ship. But uh, in 2018, the entire year, we gave out 3,032 parking tickets in the year. That doesn't include what the traffic guys do downtown, different, different entity. The Brockton Police Department themselves issued 3,032 tickets. In that total in money, 141,695. And they, it went from anywhere from parking ban violations, which was the biggest of 2,053 parking ban violations for 2018. The last storm, in case you didn't hear about it, there was, there wasn't a big storm, but we actually towed 60 cars that, that last storm. So we've talked about this the last couple of months. Um, Councilor Beauregard was on to it big time with the traffic commissioner, and he went to explain himself, explain the amount of tickets that were written and stuff. I bring it up because people thought there should have been or could have been more tickets, more tows, et cetera. And What's more, like it, 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 ta it, takes a long, it takes a long time for the tow truck to leave, the tow company to get through the snow to tow the car and then bring it back to the yard. It's an hour process, but I'm just letting you know that last storm, 60 cars were towed and we, we issued those amount of tickets in 2018. Um, the citations everybody hates, but everybody wants something done about it. We pull you over for speeding or to go into a stop sign, et cetera, et cetera. We issued 6,603 tickets for speeding, stop signs, non-license, uh, suspended license, on and on it goes. There's a whole, whole litany of stuff. And that was, uh, it totaled $371,775 in, ticket, in uh, tickets that were issued by the Broughton Police Department. Um, all of those tickets, of those 6,603, there were 3,423 civil violations, stop sign speeding, as an example. There were, because we have a heart, 1,582 written warnings. Not everybody's gonna get a ticket, it's the way it is. Police have total discretion. You may get a ticket, you may not. Total discretion, it is what it is. No one's ever changing that. But we gave out 1,582 written warnings. Uh, I don't know where they came up with this, but eight verbals. There's like what, like I give like eight verbals in a month, 
myself. So I don't know where, how that possibly could have got logged in here, but it is. And out of all those cars that were pulled over, we arrested 485 people for, for whatever reason, uh, um, suspended license, OUI, could have been anything. 485, and we took out 1,105 complaints. So we don't want to arrest you, but we can. For instance, your license is suspended. We're giving you a break, but you're going to go in court. We don't want to put the handcuffs on you. We'll see you in court in a month or two to answer to that. So we're very, we're very productive. We're very, we're out there as productive as we could be. Some may say these fines should be doubled. They should be double the tickets. It's open for debate. I know, like you know, the speeding is like, it, it seems like everyone's speeding. People just aren't paying attention. Um, we do the best we can. Those numbers may not be high enough for you. I don't know what, the, I don't know what an ideal number would be but we're always out there doing it. Uh, we have a designated four people that do traffic. Just traffic, yet every police officer can pull over a car, even if they're not in the traffic division. There was some confusion about that last week. So we're all able to give tickets out, um, and we do. So that was 2018. I'll give you 2019 stuff next year. And uh, another thing that summer's coming, firework time. Fireworks drive a lot of people crazy. I don't blame them. Just want to, uh, you know, this will be it unless you have anything else to add. Um, what people don't understand, I think Mass Massachusetts is definitely, and there's only one or two other states uh, in the U.S., in this country, that fireworks are illegal. They're illegal every place else. Not to say it's not a big to-do, but fireworks on the 4th of July, you know, the small ones that you hear going on and off, I gotta be honest, the police kind of take it like jaywalking. But there's things we can do with the calls coming in, calls coming in fireworks, fireworks, especially since fireworks will start here in another week. And then sometime long after the 4th of July, those type of fireworks bothering you, it's a noise complaint, call us, we'll come. Um, for people that have possession of the firework, we're not talking about the, the big crazy ones that you see at the fair. Anybody that has those, it's a big, it's a big to do. We, we're mandated to confiscate, we're mandated to confiscate all fireworks, the black jackets or whatever they were called, cherry bombs to the big ones, mandated to confiscate, but if you have the smaller version firecracker, it's just basically, it's a possession. You could be fined $10 to $100. Uh, we seize them, we can't arrest them, we could summons them into court for the fireworks. Most cases, teenagers, young adults, the small firecrackers, again, we would confiscate, more than likely move along if they're young, like in their teens, to their parents, it varies. Um, selling, seal of fireworks, it's a big to-do. If you're selling fireworks out of your trunk, uh, it's fine or imprisonment. I don't think anybody goes to prison for it, but that's, that's the law. 100 to to $1,000 fine. You could go to prison, uh, prison maximum of one year. So I think if you were selling like a ton of it, you could be in big trouble, a ton of fireworks. Mandatory, right, we have to seize the fireworks. And we, we can't arrest, it would be a complaint. We would take out a, com a complaint, which means they go in front of a uh, clerk of courts. And, and, they, and if they appeal the decision of the clerk, they could go in front of a judge. So although against the law, it's something like, a, a, um, it's a big to-do every year. We get a million phone calls with it, especially if they, if late at night people want to get to sleep. Um, and we, uh, we do the best we can. Uh, we co we did, like confiscate all the time. And uh, when we see them, as you know, the call comes in, the fireworks have already exploded. So there's nothing to confiscate. So we're out there. Uh, be patient, especially on the 4th of July, a lot of calls. And we get a lot of calls for fireworks, which also people call and say gunshots, which could be. So if you're not sure, still call, still call us, and we'll come to the scene and check it out. Um, anybody have any, any other questions here? Noise complaints, does everybody, everybody definitely understands the noise stuff? I know it could be unbelievable when you've got a neighbor that just does. And some of the things we've also done in neighborhoods with Crime Watch, if I've been told of an issue where there's a, say as an example, a three family, 
and this one tenant is just unbearable and I know that the whole neighborhood is just, they just can't stand anymore. The best thing I like to hear is the landlord doesn't live there. You understand? If the landlord lives there, we have issues because, you know, I've said this before over the years, we're not the mafia. So there's only so much we can do legally. And we have to play it, play it by the law. But if that, if that landlord of that three family, as an example, does not live there and he lives elsewhere in uh, Easton or Sharon, there's a lot of things we can do, um, starting with code enforcement, making their life miserable if they don't want to pay attention to the police complaints that we're getting from the neighbors. So that's always a good thing, which is why I'm saying you get a hold of me for stuff like that and I will get back to you. If the landlord, if it's a landlord tenant situation, it gets a little more complicated because there's only so much you're doing, but it goes back to what I was saying about what's going on in Council of Lally's neighborhood with the loud music, the, 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 the drum playing and whatnot. Uh, we've taken out complaints after X amount of, after X amount of complaints to the police. We can go out and take out, take out a, uh, a complaint for disturbance. So at the very least it's that, and that's gonna be tough in a, in, a, in a court of law, especially if no, especially if no witnesses show up. It, it, it tends to be dismissed. So uh, those are just a couple of things to keep in mind if you live in, in you know, around, and by the way, I didn't mean to say three families, you have very many single family homes where they're rented and the landlord doesn't live there, it's, it, it's a rental property. It makes it easy for us with an absent, uh, an absent landlord once we get them tracked them down. Yes. No, no. So there's a there's a there's a uh, law on the books, harsh and objectionable, Chapter 90 law, Mass General Law Chapter 90. I don't know what the section is, but it's harsh and objectionable. So if the car's going down the street and he's missing an exhaust, he could be ticketed, I think it's fifty dollars now. Fifty bucks now. It's gone. Yep. So so here here's the thing too. With 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 the, with the with the harsh and objectionable type noise. Say that you're, lying, you're in your house and flying by goes the motorcycles. Don't even, don't even call the police for that because it's like th there was a complaint sent to a ward counselor the other, the, uh, last week regarding the speeder. And the call went to the counselor and the counselor was told that the guy sped down the street as he has in the past and he lives at X address. This absolutely the police would never go to that house, knock on the door, and talk to a guy who allegedly speed. Probably did speed, but it's something that happened in the past. There's nothing that the police can do. A matter of fact, a matter of fact, if I came across a car accident and I didn't see it, I came across it, and the guy in one of the cars had a suspended license, shouldn't have been on the road, we can't arrest him. We could take out a complaint. It's, no, it's an unarrestable offense unless, you, unless the police officer himself witnessed it. Even though you knew he was driving, the police officer himself has to, wit has to witness it in order for us to actually arrest him. So when it gets to like, this, you, click fix is also a thing for speed, is plus the plus, uh, traffic commissioner. If you go on to the PD website, Captain John Hallisey, he's in charge of the traffic commission. I know speeding's a big to do. You could, you could email him telling him there's nonstop speed is on the street and he will send his crew down and he has a list of streets to go on. He will send his people down to do radar or whatnot. And so that's very common. We do that all of the time. But just the harsh and objectionable, the car has already gone. Okay. Oh, you understand that? that? Yeah, loud. And um, I hear a lot of them on the city, and I think that I just happen to, this one person goes by at a certain time of night. But why it, it doesn't the law shut down these motorcycles? I mean, why don't they say that, that a, a mo 
motorcycle enthusiast will say this, I want to be heard. No, really. Every, I, I want to be heard because nobody's paying attention. Poor kid got, just got killed the other day here in East Bridgewater. Every single month, especially the warm months, comes somebody dies in this area. I knew a, I knew a guy really well that died last year, a guy named Silva. Every year, every year several, they want to be heard. There's, the motorcycle makes, it makes noise. There's nothing unless there's open headers, as they used to call it, where there's no mufflers and it's really too loud where it's considered harsh, harsh and objectionable and, and, and citation could be written. And they go by your home. They go by. I just went from Ken on, and I'm like, okay, so it's great. Yep. Or 50 bags of Oh, yeah, I know where it is. Yeah. So, yep. you know, when I have my slide is open or something, I mean, it sounds like they're right in my backyard. But where are they? I, I think. Um, oh, I, I got I to be honest with you. I, I need to punt on that. There's nothing I'm doing. There's nothing nobody's doing about it. Right, right, right. I could go on and on and try to like, I'm punting on the motorcycles that go down West Chestnut Street. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about a particular bike. I'm talking about yep. all around. Yep. They are so objectionable. They are. That I don't yep. know why they just don't just say, hey. The manufacturer. Because they're, they're allowed to be on the street, registered to be on the street. Yeah. Sadly. Yes, sir? Yep. I'm wondering if you can put in a lower speed limit in an area on either side. Yep. I live on Stony Street and I get all day killed by people going through you know, the red light. Yep. You know, and if you put in a 20 mile an hour speed limit like Easton does, mm. why not? So this is what you would need to do. You ready? Traffic commission meets, is it the last Thursday or the third Thursday? Fourth, fourth Thursday. Thir You're on the commission too, you sit there? On the fourth Thursday, fourth Thursday of every month, the traffic commission meets at West, uh, the War Memorial Building on West Elm Street. Go there, lodge a not complaint or whatever you want to call it, and speak to, to Ann's on it, uh, Councilor Lally's on it, uh, uh, John Hallisey chairs it. I'm just stepping over so the, the mic can pick me up for the cable. Oh, yeah. Um, you can reach out to Captain Hallisey uh, before the meeting and request to be put on the agenda. Okay. And what they'll do is they'll put you on the agenda. When your item comes up, you can, you know, speak on it. Uh, but what I would recommend is going through your ward counselor. Uh, that way they can... That way, that way your ward counselor can come with you and sort of be your advocate for your, uh, for your issue. Uh, and then the traffic commission will hear it, and what we'll do is we'll go out and review it before the next meeting on the subcommittee. And then we'll come back and we'll do a final vote the next month. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> I just know the inside scoop to a lot of these things. In, I've already done it. I've done it five times since I've been council and it doesn't go anywhere. So yeah. yeah. It just doesn't. Well, no one, nobody believes in it because how can you have that particular street? It used to be 20 MPs. I'd love it to be, but how can it be? I'm talking about it. So if you go in Easton, over, I'm saying. Well, Easton is yeah, Easton Easton no. on the state road, okay, 138, 123. Right. You're coming to the 106. You come, you come to the stoplight. There is an area of, say, 100 yards that the speed limit is for 
Yep, 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 I know who it was too. Okay. Yep. And if you sent a guy out there every day, yep. you could find three police officers. Every single change of light, some of Well, you know what the thing is though? I'm glad you bring that up. So it's like picking fish in a battle. I know exactly who it was that was out there. I don't want to mention my hand. That money doesn't, there's only a small percentage of that money, I always forget what it is, that comes here. So when you say you could fund three more, it goes into it goes to the state. We only get you know, what's the percentage? Fifty percent. You think we get fifty? Say it's fifty percent of whatever citation we write up for speed and going through a stop sign. The other fifty percent, the way it currently stands, doesn't go to the police department. It goes to the general fund to pay for all of the other things that we need. Uh, so, yes. That, well, that's why that's why he was there. And, and there's always, and by the way, there's always, there's always grant money, you know, and, and not on top of their regular duty, there's always grant money where many guys will volunteer to go and, uh, not, you know, to, to go and do. Yeah, they're still around. Anybody else? Could, could be, all set? All right, thank you. Thank you, officer. We appreciate it very much. As always, you know that. Good job. Captain Bacow, um, anything you wanted to add to it or? Anything you just want to quickly add, or anything, uh, just so the so the people know we um, put a name with the uh, the face, I guess. Captain's fairly new, so go ahead and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Right. Hey, good evening. I'm Captain Mark Picaro. As Officer Healy said earlier, I'm the Patrol Division Commander. So what that means is I oversee all three patrol shifts for the Brockton Police Department, and. Uh, Officer Healy did a great job explaining about how to go about reporting things to us. And, you know, he, he touched upon that in this day and age between C Click Fix and Facebook and all the other apps and technology that's out there, people are, are getting away from just keeping it simple and calling the police when there's a problem and reporting this problem through other ways. At the end of the day, when you have a police issue, call the police. Just keep it simple, how people have done it for years, for 100 years. Just call the police. See, click, fix, like Officer Healy said, should be for like your potholes are out, uh, your street lights are out, you have potholes. You can use a see, click, fix for a police issue if there's been like an abandoned motor vehicle on your street for two months. But if, like, I just, I was checking my phone now during the meeting earlier this afternoon, I got a see, click, fix complaint regarding three cars parked on the sidewalk on the east side. I won't give the address, but that, that's something you should call the police department directly for. They'll put a call in for a parking violation, send a cruiser right down to hopefully catch the cars there and ticket them. By the time I get it and come into work at four, the cars are gone. You know, so at the end of the day, if, if there's a police issue, just call the police department and we'll handle it, okay? It, you're gonna get a more timely response that way. Uh, that's about all I have to say. Anybody have any issues? Yes, sir. Good, sir. How are you?
you know, more offices means we, we, we can just do more, respond to your calls quicker, maybe do some more proactive traffic enforcement or, you know, other things. Anybody else? All right, great. Easy, Captain. Thank you, sir. This time, huh? Thank right. you. Pleasure, pleasure having you here. Thank you. Just, um, I just want to um, mention a, a couple of things, and, and then we'll take any other questions that some uh, some of you may have. Um, I do have, uh, I have a uh, email uh, that I received this morning from um, Attorney uh, Nazarella, and Attorney Nazarella, as you know, has been playing a role in the situation that we have with. Um, the Meadow Woods project, which is off of West Chestnut Street. And a lot of people have asked, uh, you know, in the past couple of months and several months where we're at. And he did give me a, a, a quick a synopsis, and just so all do understand um, where we are at. He indicated uh, that he wished to update me on the above matter, which telling us that a trial did take place in, at the Plymouth County Superior Court in Brockton on February 21st, 2019. However, the matter was heard before Judge Cosgrove, but the matter is taken under, under advisement at this point, meaning that the judge will consider the evidence and then render a decision. To date, he has not received anything from the court and believed that a, a five-week minimum a time frame would be expected. And uh, then he just thanked, thanked me and appreciate me for closely following up with this matter and, and offering support to the law department in regards to the issue. And uh, once a decision is, is rendered in any such way that he would be totally, um, you know, right, uh, you know, uh, calling me and contacting me in regards to it. So at this point, nothing has transpired with that matter, with that whole project. It, it's still, it, it is still in the court's hands. And no matter how it renders, whether, you know, they win, we win, no matter what, is, uh, there's going to be an appeals to it, I'm sure. But at this point in time, um, and, and Attorney Nazarella feels that when we went to court, we had a very, very good, clean case that chances are that, you know, you know hopefully everything will, will come um, to our, to our uh, you know, height of, of saying that, you know, we've sort of won. But we won't know that. And it could take another three, four you know, three, four, five, six weeks, or even another couple of months. But uh, whenever it does, um, everybody would be notified within uh, within the area in regards to that matter. So I just wanted to I just wanted to bring you up to speed on on that. Uh, just a couple other things I just want to make mention within the uh, ward itself. And as as you uh, as you know, and I I know Mr. and Mrs. Snow are here. I mean, as you see right now, the new uh, Cumberland Farms is uh, is uh, is progressing and uh, it will be uh, opened up I'm sure I, I would venture to say they'll probably have it open at least by October November they seem to move right along once they get once they get completed so you'll have a new Cumberland Farms uh, in that location I believe there is going to be another one which will be located on Oak Street which leads into the driveway where um, what's it Walmart correct yeah, yeah Walmart in that uh, project I mean uh, plaza area which was always uh, an enormous area, I think, at that point in time, um, and uh, if I'm mistaken, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Mayor Fowler, when he was mayor, and he put the wall out there, I think he had intentions, of, uh, if he was to continue in offices, to let that area grow. So even he, um, even he, uh, you know, supported the process for that going there in the Cumberland Farms. So there'll be one located in that spot as well. So you can see some, some changes right there up on uh, that Oak Street area. The Dunkin' Donuts is already open. Uh, um, you already have Doyle's has moved into what used to be Bigford's. And the Cumberland Farms will be starting to, you know, go through. Uh, I think they have to go to zoning, if I'm not mistaken. They're on the next agenda uh, to make a couple changes to the original, to the original plan. So um, that's going to be happening. The other couple of things that we see changing here on um, up in this industrial, commercial zoned area is the fact that at some point, um, Paul Clark Volkswagen will become. Copeland Volkswagen. They're in the process of purchasing that, so that's going to transpire sometime, sometime in the summer months, July and August. And at the same time, again, um, and I was here as one of the ones to see the the growth of the Bernardi Honda Hyundai. Uh, it's going to uh, change uh, again, as it has to McGovern. Now it's going to be um, another Honda dealership will be located there. Uh, it's all owned by a, a DBA. Um, which uh, is a capital management, and I believe they also own the one. I, I think it's, 
I'm not sure where is a Randolph or somewhere going that direction where where there's a victory Honda, and I think that's what that's going to be. Um, and the Hyundai will still be known as McGovern, so they're going to be two separate pieces of uh, of not well, they are two separate pieces of land because that's how we built them with two separate pieces of land. But it's more or less they're just separating themselves. McGovern is selling off um, the Honda dealership off to this other company, so you'll see that that changing um, as well. At some time in August, you will see. Um, Commonwealth Alternative, which is the corner of Liberty Street and, and uh, West Chestnut Street. That's where the next medical marijuana will be going. Um, and they are um, grandfathered to receive recreational, same as in good health, is going through that process. And they're coming before the uh, Public Safety Committee uh, next Thursday evening uh, to discuss them, them moving forward um, so that they'll start to sell recreational uh, marijuana there. They continue to have a manufactured issue, you know, they're, I shouldn't say issue, a plant where they cultivate and they do a lot more. Um, Commonwealth Alternative will be bringing in um, their, their recreational product, all be coming in. They're not going to be doing cultivating and all that type of stuff. It's strictly going to be a recreational uh, facility, but um, they did a very nice job uh, with, that, um, with that building as well. So it's going to be a nice clean corner. There's other safety issues that are going to be addressed um, at the same time. I was just at a site review hearing yesterday, so they they know they have to make some changes. So those are just some things that are going to be happening uh, happening in the next um, in the next few months um, within this area here. So um, if any uh, if any of you is, um, have any other questions or concerns, uh, any councils want to any anybody have anything you want to add to Council Fowler or anything? Please do. $450 million, almost half a billion dollars, is the budget that we'll be reviewing next week. I suspect by next year we may hit half a billion dollars. And it's probably more like 460 or 470 million because there are grants that come in during the year for schools and public safety and some other things. So. Uh, I think speaking for all of us, and you've heard it here tonight, you have to establish some priorities. I'm all for economic development. We do need a new police, fire, and Brockton emergency management facility. But to me, it really comes down to three things, public safety, schools, and streets. You've got to have more officers to give the men and women on the police department protection, because unfortunately, the job has changed. Particularly, it's changed since I was there. Every day is a battle. Every day you don't know what you're going to run into. Every day you stop a car and you run into somebody and you don't know what they're up to. If you have more officers, you have more flexibility. You can do traffic enforcement. You can do more neighborhood crime watch. You can have more preventative police patrols. You can put somebody up on West Chestnut Street and bag some of these people that fly down there in motorcycles. So, you know, it's. I think in an election year, you need to know where we stand, and I stand with public safety. I especially stand with the schools, because our kids deserve to be competitive in a very competitive world. Uh, but I also think we've got to address the quality of life in neighborhoods. I mean, some of these streets I don't want to drive down, and I'm not being dramatic. I mean, you want to talk about pothole heaven. It's exactly the way it is. So. Collectively, we'll go over that $450 million document. Um, we'll hopefully see the money is allocated where it should be and where it isn't, if we can make some adjustments, some cuts, and have the mayor then appropriate it for public safety, streets, or something else, then I say let's do it. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and I, uh, I did all that, those same uh, those same sentiments that you have, Councillor, as well. You know that uh, we might we might not always agree on some things and some issues, but the one thing we all do agree upon is, uh, you know, what's in the best interest of this city, and that's and that's something we have to do. And, and uh, police, and um, it, there's no doubt about it. We need more police on on our streets, and um, and I'm also uh, I'm also going to try to see what we can do. I I still firmly believe, and I hope that. When I meet with um, our new uh, uh, CFO tomorrow, just briefly, that I can try to find a way to get to his head. I've always believed in, in uh, new equipment for our people, and I've also believed in, in leasing our 
vehicles for our police department because I think you can, if you know how to do it and do it right, you can, you can, you can have, you can have some good uh, equipment for these people as well. When I see these officers out driving, you know, still old Crown Victoria, it's a little different for you and I win, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, the runtime on our car isn't 380, you know, 6,000, and it is on some of them, it's 562,000. Scares me when I see them going down the road. So those are things that we need to really take a look at. And, uh, and, and I know we're, we're going to. Um, just one thing, I just want to touch base, uh, if, if I might, because I just want to clear the air quickly on, on something that just transpired last night, and, and uh, I'm not going to make it any type of a discussion this evening because it, it doesn't need to be. But last night, um, when we had the Brockton United Ordinance, I have to say that, um, and, I, and I said it when I talked to the newspaper today, I, I fell asleep at the wheel for the old guy. I just uh, wasn't paying attention. When the ordinance was to be read to go to a third reading, unfavorably, um, it, it, it shouldn't have come out of my mouth that I was yes for it because I never was because it can be interpreted that I was looking for what some people were starting to say that was a sanctuary city, and that is not true. I, in my, my mind, was never ever going to stand behind that nor vote for it, nor would I turn my backs to the people of City of Brockton for all the years I've lived here and, uh, and worked for them and supported them. So um, that's my fault. I fell asleep at the wheel. And, um, and rightfully so, the others did the right thing, be it unfavorable, didn't have to go to a third reading to come back to be discussed because there's no more to discuss. It had already been done by the ordinance subcommittee and appreciate the work that they did, uh, and, you know, very fiercely in the last couple months. But I just want to make sure that everybody knows that I voted incorrectly and I've already contacted the clerk and uh, that um, that letter is going into the clerk tomorrow morning to uh, indicate that uh, I did not pay attention. So first time kick me. I guess that's what happens after 16 years, but no way would I, no way was I standing behind that, no matter how you try to, you know, dot the I across the T differently, it wasn't going to happen, but that's all, that's all said and done, so, yeah, so I appreciate you coming this evening, okay? Appreciate it very much, and as always, and we'll have, we'll have another ward meeting probably sometime in the fall, okay? All right, thanks. Enjoyed. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I'll be in touch with you. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all.